With so many media outlets hawking bad economic news to improve their ratings, you'd be excused if you thought the entire world's economy was on the verge of collapse. So I thought it was time to get a well-balanced, well-researched view. And to that end, I knocked on the door of Christopher Joy, one of Australia's most respected economists and fund managers. It's a slightly scary episode 610 of the 13-year-old award-winning small business big marketing podcast. Well, I said, welcome to a small business marketing show, where successful small business owners share their souls to take your marketing straight to the lead. Now, here's your host, Mr. Tim Bowie. And welcome back to your weekly dose of business and marketing wake-up calls. I'm your host, Timbo Reed, and I have an insatiable curiosity front covering marketing ideas that help businesses just like yours to grow. I do that by having a weekly in-depth conversation with a successful business owner that has tread the path before us. You infinitely more importantly, well, you're a motivated business owner ready to crank out some great marketing to build that beautiful business of yours into the empire it absolutely deserves to be. As per usual team, there's marketing G-O-L-D dripping. From the ceiling over here at Small Business Big Marketing's HQ. So let's get stuck right in. A reminder that I have an effective outsourcing webinar coming up on Thursday, November 10. In fact, it's at midday and at 7 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time to cover both sides of the world. Join me. It's free. You'll discover what is effective outsourcing and what it isn't, how you can benefit both from a business point of view and a well-being point of view, the traps to avoid, what you can outsource, how to do it effectively, what it should cost, all your questions answered. And we'll be joined by Jeff Collinson, who's an outsourcing expert, an Aussie guy who lives on the ground in the Philippines and owns and runs a BPO, a business process outsourcing business. You'll also hear from longtime listener and past guest Scott Hunt, who'll share how he's made outsourcing work over time for his fitness business. Great case study uh, to be shared. And we'll be answering your questions if you are part of my Facebook tribe, which is free. Go and join that. Hey, to be first in the know in regards to the webinar, be a member of the tribe, but more importantly, subscribe over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. Just join my list and I will send you the link to the webinar when it is out but it is November 10, midday and 7 p.m. Save the date. Last week, I had the pleasure of hearing today's guest speak about the state of the Australian economy and what the coming 12 months looks like from a business and investment perspective. His name is Christopher Joy, and he's one of Australia's leading economists. How's this for his CV? He's the founder of Coolabar Capital, a funds management business with $7 billion under management. Prior to starting Cooler Bar in 2011, he worked for Goldman Sachs in London and for the Reserve Bank of Australia. In 2008, the Australian government invested $15 billion behind a policy proposal he personally developed. He was invited by the Rockefeller and MacArthur Foundations to advise the Obama administration on the US housing crisis. And in his spare time, he writes a weekly column for the Australian Financial Review. Impressive stuff, huh? Now, in the spirit of total honesty, the economy is a topic that I'm no expert on. I scraped through year 12 economics and was glad to see the back of it, let me tell you. So this was a pretty hard interview to prep for, and there were times when I simply didn't know what I should ask next. There you go. That's honesty. I'll now take my dunce hat off and say with hand on heart that despite my ignorance, Chris comes through with the goods. He has an uncanny way of, most of the time, making the complicated beautifully simple. The first part of this chat is all about his current business. Then we get into the heavy stuff. So put your big pants on as Chris gives us his deeply researched insights into what we can expect economically in 2023 and beyond and what we can do as business owners to prepare for it and ensure as smooth a ride as possible. And I know it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, Chris's advice is of a general nature, not specific to your business. So please, please, please do your own research before acting on anything he suggests. Here's Chris describing Cooler Bar Capital. Uh, we're a fund manager. We run about $7 billion in fixed income strategies. So for those who don't know what that means, we basically trade debt. 
So folks would be familiar with trading equities or stocks. Um, we are <clears throat> trading debt securities or bonds. Um, practically, what, the, what does that mean? Uh, we kind of find ourselves in a position where uh, we're actually lending money to banks. Um, so I might invest in a CBA senior bond and say put $100 million in that bond. That money will go to CBA and ultimately CBA will use that money to lend itself. Um, <clears throat> the name Coolabar is, uh, uh, I guess, comes from obviously the, the Coolabar tree, which is an Indigenous Australian tree that um, you know is very durable and resilient. It had a multiplicity of purposes that uh, Indigenous Australians uh, used it for, obviously featured prominently in our de facto na national anthem, Waltzing Matilda. And uh, yeah, it just seemed like a... Um, a kind of iconic symbolic representation of you know what we aspire to be. Chris, you 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 got a great a great bio, which we just don't have the time to read, but you worked at Goldman Sachs in London and Sydney. You've worked for the Reserve Bank of Australia. What was happening in twenty eleven for you to decide to go out on your own? Well actually I went out on my own originally in I think it was two thousand four. And I was studying at Cambridge University. Um, I was on a scholarship there doing a PhD and um, I ended up setting up a quantitative research business um, <clears throat> and an investment business uh, that we ultimately ended up selling to Macquarie Bank in 2010 on a, I think it was a $26 million valuation. And that business had an enormous amount of innovative intellectual property um, that was uh, ultimately worth a, a great deal. Uh, it specialised in um, developing analytics um, for markets like residential property that were backing assets that we were investing in. Uh, so debt securities, um, it was another debt investment business. Um, and so we practically developed these daily house price indices to track movements in Aussie housing that are now used by a company called CoreLogic. And when you read in the paper about Sydney or Brisbane house prices rising or falling, that actual data comes from those indices that we developed, um, which were the first daily house price indices, I think, developed anywhere in the world and very accurate and are now the RBA's preferred benchmark. Um, but one of the things that uh, we discovered in that investment business <clears throat> is notwithstanding the returns were very good and, uh, you know, we travelled through the global financial crisis exceptionally well, it was hard to scale that business. So I think we raised about 100 to $200 million of funding, not for the business itself, but rather for the portfolios we were running. Um, and uh, But we couldn't scale it to billions of dollars. And so we sold the business to Macquarie Bank. And then in 2011, I set up Coolabar. Uh, and in 2012, uh, February 2012, we la launched our first product. We started with about $2 million of um, funds under management uh, and have risen to about $7 billion over the last decade or so. And it, there were two of us who started the business, and we've now probably got about 33 staff spread across Sydney, Melbourne, and London. Um, and actually, I sort of commute between Sydney and, and the Sunshine Coast, um, yeah, you know, arguably the cheapest resi property market in Australia. I just shout out to little, little old Pridgin Beach. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, mate. You've, I've, I listened to you on a couple of podcasts over the weekend. You're not, you're not afraid to uh, pump the tyres of Parisian Beach, which I'm very happy for, given we both live there. Oh, mate, Parisian is am amazing. Like, you look at Noosa, and it's heinously expensive. Like, you know, you've got Gina Reinhardt living in Noosa or, you know, Sunshine Beach. Um, but, you know, there are knockdowns on the beach. Like, I looked at a uh, – or I saw a property that I think was 600 square metres on Seaview Terrace, Sunshine Beach, uh, there was basically a knockdown. It sold for eighteen and a half million, and then you know similar land at Pridgian Beach, which is the same beach just a few kilometres down the road. Um, you could probably buy for three or four million dollars. So um, you know, great little community. Pridgian's an incredibly beautiful place, and it's a privilege. In fact, we could almost do a, an entire podcast dedicated to it, but we won't. Tell me, um, seven billion dollars under management. Let, I just need to understand that. Um, that's seven billion dollars of high net worth individuals' money. Is that right? 
Um, actually, you know, mainly superannuation funds, insurance companies, uh, some high net worths, uh, some offshore investors, but yeah, retail money as well. Um, we run a one of the products that you know, if your listeners they might um, have had some exposure to, is we run an exchange traded fund called an ETF for a company called Beta Shares, um, and it's called the Australian. Um, hybrids fund uh, and its ASX ticker is HBRD and that has about 1.9 billion in it. Um, so it invests in bank hybrids which are uh, basically a bank, if you think about a normal business, you fund yourself through equity which you own and debt which you've borrowed from the bank or someone like CBA has equity and then it also has debt. And the debt is made up of bank deposits. So when you invest in a bank deposit, you're lending money to banks. And that's one debt instrument that banks use to fund themselves with. But they also issue other debt instruments. So senior bonds, subordinated bonds, and things called hybrids. And in that uh, HBRD ETF, the yield on that portfolio is probably about 6% right now. Um, and you know, bank equities are only paying, well, CBA, shares are probably paying you a frank dividend yield of about 5.5%. So that, that product's been very popular as an income solution, um, and that's that's a retail product. So we have a fairly diverse investor base. I, I listened to an interview with Mark Zuckerberg about three weeks ago. It was Joe Rogan was interviewing him, and Rogan said to Zuckerberg, you know, how, how many people, you know, how many people do you represent? How many people are using Facebook and Instagram? And I think the number between the two is $5 billion around the world. And Rogan's question then to Zuckerberg was, does that carry a weight? So I guess it's the same question to you from me. Does does being responsible for $7 billion of both, you know, uh, the smaller end of town's money right up to institutional money, does what does that carry a weight or pressure? You're, you're a smart guy, you know, but, but do you think about it on a daily basis or is it just a number? Um, yeah, it absolutely does. It's a huge burden and a huge responsibility having carriage, um, for that for that amount of money, um, I guess I'm lucky because I've got 33 guys and girls who work alongside me, and um, we've got the biggest team in uh, the Australian fixed income market. Um, so our team's unusually large. Normally, guys running that sort of amount of money would probably only have anywhere from you know, seven to 15 people. Um, mm-hmm. So I've got portfolio managers that help run the money uh, all around the world. Uh, and we've got you know, tremendously talented analysts. We've got uh, 13 or 14 analysts. Um, five of those guys have PhDs. Um, and it is interesting that, um, you know, for us, whether we're running 500 mil, 5 billion, or frankly, 15 billion, um, doesn't really change the day-to-day decision-making, tempo, calculus, uh, and the velocity of our uh, analytical or thought process, because you know, again, if I'm investing five million dollars in a bond, fifty million, or one hundred and fifty million, it's all the same process. The fund, the fundamentals remain the same. Yeah, but it is. Um, it's an interesting point. It is a. Uh, it is a big responsibility um, and a big burden, and um, you know, all all you can do is work as hard as uh, is humanly possible. And um, and apply yourself as intensively as possible, as intensively as possible, and uh, ensure that you're trying to maximise uh, the outcomes for uh, our investor base. You're clearly very good on the tools. I imagine where the business is at at the moment has made has forced you to cut, be, get off the tools, and focus more on. Maybe I'm wrong, but but client management, acquisition, retention. Or are you still one of those business owners that has everyone else do that and you just love doing what you're doing with, I'm going to say naively, spreadsheets and numbers, but you know what I mean. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I think um, owner founders in small business, like my business is a small business. Um, you know, again, you know, we've got only 33 staff and it's small enough uh, to have a very high performance culture. And I think in that context, um, it's small enough for me to focus on running the money with the, the wider, uh, we've got about 25 people now in, you know, in the investment team. So that's the, the team that is, as you would describe it, on the tools, uh, buying and selling securities all day, every day. Um, when you get to, I think when you get beyond 10 to 15 people on a team, you move beyond um, what is a really, uh, I think, focused 
tip of the spear an optimally sized high performance unit into a slightly more um, uh, well a slightly broader structure that does require much more management time uh, in terms of human capital management. Um, so it really for me is a composite of both. I think again businesses of my size, the um, CEOs can be involved in all aspects of the business in a very intimate way. Um, and you're not sort of delegated purely to that 60,000 foot view of the world where you know, you've got a big management team beneath you and you've delegated everything. Um, I remember speaking to the CEO of CBA and Narev, the former CEO of CBA, and I said, oh, it must be amazing being CEO of the biggest bank in Australia and one of the biggest banks in the world. And he said, actually, you know, basically all I deal with is the shit. The shit just kind of rolls uphill and and I'm just dealing with, you know, one crisis after another. Uh, I think that's true of all, you know, leaders and all CEOs um, to some extent. But I think that with a business of our size, I'm very much on the tools. So I'm working with our London team, trading the US market, trading the US, uh, the European market, trading the Aussie market. Um, I'm still very much engaged in day-to-day -day investment decisioning, um, but also having to help drive uh, performance and people management. Um, and then, frankly, just the grind of, you know, the administration of a, a small business. So, you know, the finance and accounting, the risk management, um, the legal function, um, and uh, and then the marketing and sales. And so you mentioned that, like, you know, we, we have a lot of clients, we have tens of thousands of clients. And yeah, I need to be um, able to access those clients. And I do that through things like podcasts, through writing a lot online. So I publish a lot of our commentaries on a, a website called Livewire. I also write a weekly newspaper column for the Financial Review. Um, uh, and then I try and make myself as available as possible to um, our global clientele. So if they ever want to have a chat about markets, you know, pretty much anyone is free to reach out. So whether it's a, a guy that has $10,000 or a guy that has, you know, $100 million, I'm, I'm kind of still having or willing to have the conversation. I, I think that's really admirable. I picked that up when I saw you speak the other night at the Parisian Digital Hub, you know, like you are a very giving person. So you're clearly part of your nature. And as a result, you've, you've built a pretty strong personal brand that has you writing for the Fin Review, that has you... Um, did, I, did I pick it up correctly, Chris, that you have a couple of ex-Prime Ministers on your payroll or at least as advisors to call the bar, or did I dream that? No, that's definitely not right. Um, I, I've, I've advised um, some prime ministers in the past. So I advised John Howard um, on housing policy. I advised Scott Morrison on um, uh, you know, financial policy on occasion. Uh, developing a few specific policies for um, ScoMo. Well, you you even advised the Obama administration on on the housing crisis. Yeah, in in during the global financial crisis, yeah, I went to the US and and did render some advice on uh, their problems over there. So, C can you pinpoint one thing? And please, you can lose all humility on this podcast, Chris. But you know. Um, one point in time, because again, your personal brand in your industry is very strong. What was it? Was it something that you achieved? Was it just having a great network? Was it the fact that you write an editor for the AFR, the Australian Financial Review? Personal branding is really interesting, I guess, in the context of business owners. Some some pursue it, others don't. You have. I guess um, my focus has always been on an analysis and research. And so one thing that we've been pretty good at is doing a lot of deep quantitative research on the world and trying to understand what's driving the world and then publishing research that anticipates um, future problems um, or tries to shed light on the direction of the world in the, the, the short to medium term. So some examples of that were, you know, in 2003, I wrote a 380 page report for Prime Minister John Howard on the Aussie housing market. And that was the first report that really showed that it was actually constraining supply of housing and specifically new development um, and restrictions on land release programs, restrictions on densities and development generally. By constraining housing supply, we were forcing house prices up 
and exacerbating those housing problems. And then from that report, I mentioned that I developed a quantitative research business that developed house price indices that are still do, still used today and a bunch of other analytical tools that banks use today. Um, and then I was always very interested in the policy realm. So in the global financial crisis, I guess I published research with a professor at Melbourne University that um, suggested that the government needed to invest in something called um, the residential mortgage-backed securities market, and the government put about $15 billion behind that idea in the GFC. Uh, as you mentioned, I also went over to the US and um, offered some uh, insights on their problems. Um, and then you know, over time, I've, I've kind of continued just um, either you know, privately or publicly providing a lot of advice and analysis on different problems and different opportunities and hoping to add value to the way people think. Um, more recently, I guess in, you know, for example, February 2020, before the pandemic really exploded, we started developing forecasting models to forecast how quickly these infection rates would spread around the world and then tried to uh, make um, some inferences about what that meant for global financial markets. So in February 2020, I was telling the, the Prime Minister at the time, Scott Morrison, and the Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, privately that I thought markets were going to collapse and they would need to provide a lot of support and stimulus. Um, I mentioned, or I raised those same concerns with the Reserve Bank of Australia. Uh, they eventually got around to doing it in sort of mid to late March 2020. Uh, and then in March 2020, um, you know, our view was that the first waves of infections, based on our, our modelling, they would peak in April 2020, uh, and that you know governments would provide a lot of stimulus, and that would drive um, a lot of uh, um, asset price. Uh, gains globally. So stocks would rise, interest rates would fall, house prices would rise. So we actually bought about a billion dollars of assets in March 2020, and that proved to be a good decision. In March 2020, I don't know if you remember, but everyone was super negative on the Aussie housing market, saying house prices were going to fall 10, 20%. <laughs> our analysis <laughs> suggested double. Yeah, our analysis suggested that house prices would only fall 0 to 5%. So I wrote this in March 2020 saying the house prices would fall 0 to 5% between March and September that year, but thereafter would rise by about 20%, and that's exactly what happened. So we were very bullish on housing. Um, and uh, last year, another example is if you go to the website, www.predictingwar.com, um, we, we released um, a whole bunch of modelling we'd done on the, the likelihood of countries going to war with one another. So we took 160 years of military conflict data, but also a ton of data on the uh, the attributes of different countries globally, their economies, their populations, their political systems. And we built models to try and understand what are the attributes that drive countries to war. And, and that website's publicly available and, and basically, again, shows that, for example, you know, based on the statistics, taking subjectivity and opinion more or less out of the equation, um, you know, our modelling suggests there's a 74% chance that Taiwan and China have a military conflict in the next 10 years. And, and that's really kind of come to, um, you know, it's been front of mind more recently uh, with, you know, all the, uh, the tensions between U the US and China and, and by extension Australia. So I think that the the exposure we've had um, nationally uh, has really been a function of intellectual edge and trying to innovate intellectually and, and trying to be unconventional in our thinking um, and, and trying to really expand and improve our understanding of the world in which we live. So my advice to SMEs would be that um, if you feel like you have intellectual edge, um, you know, that, that's a kind of really fruitful and productive avenue of inquiry, because if you can change the way people think about the world through insight and analysis and opening their eyes to new thoughts and new... One, one thing I do find is that every single time, more or less, you come up with this new perspective on the world, initially there's a lot of inertia and resistance and, and people want to push back against it. Like in March 2020, I was, I was criticised relentlessly for being positive on house prices. Right, and then of course you have the housing boom, and, and everyone's positive on house prices. And then in October last year, having been the biggest housing boom in the market, uh, we turned around and said, "Listen, we think house prices are going to fall 15 to 25 percent because the RBA is going to lift interest rates aggressively." And that's obviously you know, started to play out. We're seeing national house prices right now fall at a 16 percent annual rate. Um, but initially, in October last year, in November, 
uh, and December, people were very, uh, early on, were very critical because they didn't want to hear that bad news. Similarly, when we published the, what we call the War Laboratory or the, the War Lab at Predicting Watercom, people were like, okay, you're being a warmonger. Like, you know, why, why are you telling people that there's a, a high chance of military conflict? But it's not that we want to deliver positive or negative news. We want to render insight that improves the, the way people think about the world. small business owners listening, there is a lot of doom and gloom out there. You only have to open the papers and put on the TV or whatever. It's all doom and gloom. And, and, you know, talk to my kids about this and it's all about ratings. My view, and you're in the media, I'm in the media, you know, doom and gloom sells. I don't want to be selling doom and gloom. You're not that kind. You're not the mongerer, as you say, that does the same thing. Um, Two questions around that. One, do you suggest that small business owners just don't consume media? And get on with running a really good business, or if they if they should consume media, what's the best source in Australia for them to look to without having the you know pants scared off them? I mean, I just look at my own media consumption habits. Uh, I I kind of read most of the mainstream media in Australia, but I also read a lot of the mainstream media overseas. So I'll read the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, the Australian, here the Financial Review some of the Fairfax publications, and you want to build up a composite picture of what is happening around the world. Now, I think that any SME, you probably don't want to pay for, I also have the benefit of something called a Bloomberg terminal, which means that I get all the Bloomberg um, uh, media as well. But I think that what you just want to do is make sure that your consumption of media is global uh, and it has balance. Um, and I absolutely do think you want to consume a lot of media. There is definitely a lot of sensationalism. You know, the media is hedonistic and it's going to want to sell uh, whatever sensationalist story they can deliver uh, at any point in time. But um, I think that ignorance is bliss but uh, and, and you know, knowledge is a burden. But, um, but if you're running a business and you're trying to stay at the cutting edge of your industry and at the vanguard of all the available insight and analysis, I think you, you really do want to consume, frankly, as much media as possible. But beyond the mainstream media, I think podcasts are great. Um, I think uh, uh, in any proprietary research that you can get you know, through your industry, I do find that in every industry there are kind of uh, subject matter experts that tend to have proprietary research that you have to pay for or that just may be more difficult to access. And that proprietary research is always going to give you a bit of a competitive advantage or what we call edge. So if you did own a small business, which you do, Chris, but, you know, what measures would you be suggesting to put in place for the coming 12 months? So I'm saying to get rid of the bumps, but to reduce the bumps and just sort of, you know, having things in place that, you know, hey, look, um, the, the ship's in pretty good shape. It's going to be a rough sea, but we're okay. What are those measures? Yeah, I think cost control's really important. Um, I think the labour market is turning right now. I've recently hired five people, and I've definitely detected a big shift in the labour market. Um, you know, none of the, in terms the, of more more people coming onto the market. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, there's. We've actually just published some research on this on Friday. But um, we had, this is another, I guess, example of us offering a bit of insight. Uh, last year, we argued that once the federal election was done and dusted we, and the borders opened up, we'd get a tsunami of um, migration uh, from students and skilled migrants and, and folks on work visas. And the data shows that right now. So in the last quarter of data released by the government, um, we've had the biggest quarterly immigration intake in 20 years. We've had the biggest student intake ever in history, and we've had very strong skilled and work visa migration. So just taking a step back for SMEs and for small business owners like ourselves, I think that if you're patient, um, you know, wage growth has been a challenge of late. You know, everyone's making wage claims. But I think if you're patient, you're going to see the balance of power shift back to employers. And Having just, as I mentioned, hired five people in the last month, um, I've detected a big shift. Uh, we, we've had seen a big rise in the number of applicants per job. Uh, and if you look at the SEEK data, I think they're reporting similar trends. Uh, SEEK have also seen the first um, decline in advertised salaries in a long time, really since before the uh, pandemic. So the uh, actual advertised salaries are starting to roll over. Um, I think we went through this little air pocket where you know, there was no foreign labour, there was no immigration, 
we actually lost about 350,000, Australia lost 350,000 foreign workers that were residents here. And those jobs were taken by locals, but obviously the, the labour market tightened up. And then what that means is that the unemployment rate basically fell to circa half century low. So our unemployment rate fell to 3.4%. And uh, it made it very tough, I think, on small business to find stuff. And, um, you know, very, very tough to manage those costs. So I think we're going to see a huge amount of relief on the cost side in terms of wage growth and, and the availability of labour. Um, and I think cost management um, and not 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 sort of reacting uh, in an exaggerated fashion to current inflation and current cost pressures. So I think a lot of the, you know, for example, the construction price pressures we've observed are also going to dissipate substantially. We're seeing a big fall in timber prices, uh, a big reduction in freight costs, um, a big reduction in... Um, uh, you know, some key commodity prices. Um, and I think that's going to continue uh, because globally central banks are increasing interest rates. That The impact of that is it's going to cool demand very significantly. Um, you know, the US is likely to go into a recession. I think Australia will flirt with, you know, the potential or possibility of a recession. Um, the RBA has been incredibly aggressive raising interest rates. They've lifted rates by you know, 2.5% or 250 basis points. I think we are going to see more rate hikes from the RBA, unfortunately, but I think they're going to slow down. They've already slowed down. So in October, they only lifted rates by 25 basis points, having given us um, several months of 50 basis point hikes. I think we'll get another 25 in November and another 25 in December, but potentially that will be it. Maybe we get one more in February next year, which is better meet in January. Um, but I think... If, if small business is patient, they're going to they're gonna see more relief on input cost pressures. They're going to see more relief, relief on labour cost pressures. Um, we're definitely going to have a hell of a lot more labour supply or, or labour to access. Um, I do think the revenue side of the equation is going to be very difficult because I think we're going to go into um, some sort of uh, correction. Now, whether we experience a recession, nobody knows. That's, that's very, very hard to forecast. Recessions in Australia, um, thankfully, have been very rare. We had one in the pandemic, but beyond that, uh, the last time we had a recession was 1991, but that was kind of more similar to the current situation than our past downturns, whether, whether it be the global financial crisis or um, you know, the early 2000s period when we had the so-called tech wreck. Um, this time around, we've had a very big increase in interest rates, and we're likely to see um, an interest rate-led a default cycle, so people will start defaulting more on their debts uh, and just demand destruction. The whole purpose of the RBA's policy changes is to destroy demand. They want to they want to reduce wage growth. They want to increase the unemployment rate to create more balance in the economy between demand and supply. Um, there is an argument that the RBA is rep- responding to supply side pressures. So the increase in, fl- in inflation has clearly been driven initially by that supply side shock, as in economies being closed. Um, you know, factories shutting down uh, and, and all those supply side costs rising through the roof. But the supply side starting to open back up now and, and lubricate and those price pressures will start to alleviate. Um, the problem, of course, is we also had a huge fiscal stimulus. The government injected massive amounts of cash into the economy and we had zero interest rates, zero uh, percent interest rates uh, here in Australia, zero point, you know, the RBA cash rate fell to zero point one percent. And so that created a lot of demand as well as supply side pressures. And that demand uh, uh, side pressure is what the RBA is trying to take away. Now, before they cut the cash rate um, in March 2020, it was at sitting, sitting at 0.75%. And in June 2019, it was at 1.5%. Well, right now, the cash rate is at 2.6%, and it's likely going to probably 3.1%. Um, so they've not only taken away demand, but they've actually given us much higher interest rates than we had before the pandemic. So they've actually made life you know, more difficult than perhaps it should be. Um, but I think patience, uh, and I think, so patience is you know one key message. Looking through the current price pressures uh, to the other side, where you're going to see a lot of price relief, I think is important. And then the final point I'd make is that I think you'll see that a lot of small businesses, unfortunately, that were high growth businesses that you did use quite a lot of debt, um, didn't have much in the way of profits, if you know any profits at all, um, 
uh, I think that those businesses will probably sadly fall by the wayside. Are these the zombies that you refer to in your your blogging? Yeah, so so we we look at the proportion of listed companies on the stock market that haven't had enough profits for three years in a row to pay the interest on their debt. And we find that in Australia, the UK, Europe and the US, about 15% of all firms fall into that, that zombie category. And the proportion of listed companies that are zombies has has increased by one and a half to two times over the last 10 years. So we've seen a huge increase in zombies surviving on cheap money um, you know, with zero interest rates or near zero interest rates. And um, I think a lot of those high growth racy firms uh, that were fueled by cheap money will um, will struggle, and I think that um, for some small businesses that'll be a good thing, and sadly for other small businesses that'll be a bad thing because they may. What we find is when we look at those zombie companies, they tend to unfortunately be mostly SMEs, so they're mostly smaller and medium-sized companies, and they tend to be in industries like real estate, technology, communications, resources. Um, and uh, healthcare. Any industries you're really bullish on if you were to start a business today? Gee whiz, like I've been pretty bearish like since late last year. You know, we, we had <laughs> bullish might that, be the wrong word. Yeah, no, no, but I, I, I think, you know, there, there are opportunities out there. But uh, since in, in December last year, I wrote in the AFR that we thought equities would fall 30%. We thought house prices obviously fall 15 to 25%. We thought that interest rates would go up very, very sharply. And that sharp increase in interest rates would create all sorts of problems uh, for the uh, global financial system and global financial markets. If I was to say, what, what, what could we be kind of positive about? Um, well, I think two things. I do think this immigration tsunami, so the massive influx in overseas migrants that we're going to see uh, into Australia has to create opportunity. Um, so any businesses that are leveraged to uh, that migration story um, certainly, education businesses uh, are going to see you know big, big revival in in students. Um, but there'll be many other sectors. We've got one locally in Lexus. Yeah, yeah. I think I think the um, uh, you know that that uh, you know, suppliers of you know low cost accommodation. Um, yeah, the the I know that there are some very successful businesses that focus on that um, you know transient traveller market. The um, you know, the, the backpacker industry, um, but anyone leveraged to students, skilled migrants, the return of tourism, uh, the Aussie dollar, you know, is obviously uh, trading it around, it was trading at 62 US cents right now, where are we? I'll just find it in a moment, but uh, the Aussie dollar coming down, particularly versus the, yeah, we're currently at 62 US cents, Aussie dollar depreciation versus, versus the US dollar means that, um any import competing businesses in Australia are going to do quite well. Uh, tourism should do quite well. Um, so it's more you know, obviously very expensive for us to travel to the US, conversely very cheap for Americans to travel to Australia. Unfortunately, on a trade-weighted, business, uh, trade-weighted basis, our exchange rate has not fallen nearly as much um, versus um, you know, things like the euro um, uh, and other currencies. But it's still fallen... I'm just going to have a look at this. Uh, let's have a look at this. Um, it's still fallen um, on a yeah on a trade weight basis. It's still fallen a bit, um, but um, yeah, that, I think I think to be honest, it's going to be pretty tough um, over the next year or two. Unfortunately, for most businesses, I think it's going to be a very difficult time for SMEs. Yes, I thought you'd say that. Well, you've given us a few sort of points to sort of ease the burden. I, I went out to my listeners, Chris, asking for some questions. You've answered most of them. <laughs> the, the top one was, should we be worried? Um, it's sort of a yes and a no. There's things you can put into place, cost control, know that there's more staff coming online, you can have access to more staff thanks to the immigration policies of the government. But, you know, there is, there's a sense of... Well, I think also, I, th- I think that actually on that point, like I think you're going to ne- be able to negotiate much better deals you know, in the next year or two than we have in the past. Things like tenancies, you know, the commercial property market's getting KO'd right now through higher interest rates. Um, yeah, I think you're going to be able to negotiate better, much better deals with your, your your teams, so your staff costs, your input costs, hopefully you'll see relief there. Um, I think that if you're a small business that's looking to buy other businesses, you're going to see some awesome... So this was the other positive I didn't mention, was I do think you're going to see some... 
potentially very attractive investment opportunities over the next year or two, because a lot of businesses are going to get crushed. I'm not convinced we have a huge bounce out of this retrenchment in activity. I don't think we see a massive, in the past when we've had you know asset prices fall sharply, house prices fall sharply, we've seen a really strong bounce back. I think we end up with structurally higher interest rates. So I don't think the bounce is going to be super strong, but there will be a bounce. I also think there's a decent chance the RBA has to start reversing course at some point, maybe in the second half of next year, um, because you know it's it's hiked rates so aggressively without having the benefit of any really really any data um, to aside from the lagging inflation and the lagging uh, jobs data, uh, but the real time data. If you look at Aussie house prices, they're completely cratering as we predicted they would last year, and and that suggests that interest rates are having a very big real impact on the economy. Um, but we won't see that in the data uh, for another six to 12 months. And when the RBA changes interest rate settings, it normally actually takes several years to that for that to percolate right through the economy. So I think that strong businesses that can be patient and can withstand some of these shocks are going to really consolidate and, and kind of appropriate a lot of market share. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think, I think for the, the, the patient, the strong, uh, they're going to survive and thrive. Uh, and and they may be able to, may be able to capitalise on some attractive investment opportunities over the next year or two. Yeah, it's always positive than the negatives, hey, Chris. I really appreciate your time, mate. I know you're a busy guy, but thank you for taking us inside a topic that is actually quite complicated. So <laughs> you've made it pretty easy to understand. And thank you for that. I thoroughly enjoyed your chat at the Perigian Digital Hub the other night, and you continue to to share the gold. So thanks, brother. If people want to find out more about Chris. Coolabarcapital.com is his main website. Um, predict what was the uh, predictingwar.com. Dot com, you know, and you can go to my Twitter feed, which is uh, I think it's at cjoye, uh, and then I, I publish regularly on Livewire, which is a um, Livewire Markets. I think the web address is um, yeah, it's livewiremarkets.com, uh, and I publish every other day, sort of on that as well. Oh, that's awesome, mate. What's your favourite social media channel? Is it Twitter? Oh, mate, I've got to tell you, I don't really... <laughs> I'm with you. I know what you're going to say. Yeah, I, uh, I I kind of publish, like, our analysis on Twitter, but I don't really engage on Twitter. You'd, you'd rather own a social media channel than, than participate in one. Yeah, that's right. I think social media, you know, obviously is super important and, and valuable as a platform to disseminate, you know, your wares and, and your views of the world, but... I do think it's a massive distraction from the day-to-day decisioning of a small business. Couldn't agree more. Hey, thanks, Chris. Thanks, mate. There you go, team. Coolabar Capital founder and one of Australia's leading economists, Christopher Joy. I hope there was something in there for you and that you can see the light at the end of what may be a longish tunnel, but there were some strategies that Chris shared that you can put in place. On a positive note, I'd love to know what is working for your business right now. It could be from a marketing perspective. It could be from a cost-saving perspective. Just something that you can share with the rest of us so that we can all grow those empires that we desperately want to. So call the Small Business Big Marketing Hotline on 0480 015 150, just like motivated business owner Mitch Brown did. G'day, mate. My name's uh, Mitch Brown, and I'm the owner of a new startup uh, we're called The Gusty Crew. Um, I have found myself in a space, uh, and it's a little token to our name. Uh, I just did a, a gutsy call uh, one day and, uh, and asked a friend, uh, what would it take? Uh, well, sorry, what would he pay me if I was able to uh, um, get him to a capacity where he was uh, full time as a buyer's agent within 12 months, what would he pay? And uh, ever since then, I've sort of launched myself into uh, into this space uh, of SEO marketing, uh, and almost have no idea what to do. <laughs> so uh, I'm finding myself, um, yeah, giving quotes and uh, and sort of uh, meeting and, and creating um, sales strategies and things like things like this for um, for a whole manner of people now. Um, and I thought, I, I man, I heck, I, I need to upskill myself. So I started, uh, I, so I stumbled upon your podcast and just listened to episode um, 596 with the electric bikes. Uh, that one was fantastic, and I, I learned from that. So I just wanted to say I appreciate your podcast, and I'm glad I found it, 
and look forward to learning more um, from all your sort of stuff. That's all I had to say. Just wanted to say thanks. <laughs> thanks a lot. Cheers. Hey, Mitch. Thank you, buddy. Thanks for calling in, taking the time to call in, sharing your story, sharing your enthusiasm, and well done on taking action, brother, because that, my friend, is where the action is. Everyone else, please be like Mitch and give me a buzz, 0480-015-150, and let me know one idea you've implemented from this podcast. I'd love to hear that, not this episode in particular, but just over the course of listening, one idea you've implemented, 0480-015-150. You'll find it on every page of my website over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com as well. Super duper guests coming up in the coming weeks. We'll hear from one of Australia's leading e-commerce specialists who's just written the e-commerce for dummies book. A fourth generation business owner from New York joins us who makes a most unusual product that I never, ever thought I'd be interviewing anyone about. Turns out to be a really interesting interview. And we'll catch up with a world surfing champion who's now on a mission to help people find their purpose in life. If you enjoyed today's app, be sure to hit the subscribe button, please. Even leave a review on iTunes. That would be so appreciated. You'll also find 609 more chats with successful business owners on your favorite podcast app. As usual, this show has been stitched together by editor extraordinaire Alex Amster, the music bed written, sung, and produced by our very own rock star, Lockie Dolly. But most importantly, it's a big thank you to you for tuning in. May your marketing be the absolute best marketing. Bye for now.